Good afternoon, everyone. A very warm welcome to another session of our Research Futures Seminars or webinars. We are today extremely delighted to welcome our colleague from Portsmouth, Dr. John Young. John is going to address a really interesting topic, a very powerful and yet intriguing title. He's going to tell us much more about that, but let me introduce John. John is Acting Director of the Institute of Biological and Biomedical Sciences at the University of Portsmouth. He's an Associate Professor or Reader of Transnational Medicine. John undertook his undergraduate uh, degree in biology with uh, um, a year in industry at the University of York. Then he went on to his PhD at the University of Cambridge. He then held a series of postdoctoral research roles at the University of Oxford, Nevada, Renault and Surrey. And in 2010, he was awarded an Age UK research into aging and Rose Trees Trust Research Fellowship before joining the University of Portsmouth as Senior Lecturer in Biomedical Sciences in 2012. In his time at Portsmouth, he has led projects towards the discovery of biomakers for the diagnosis of bladder diseases, and is currently being developed into diagnosis tech for the use of GP surgeries, pharmacies, and nursing care homes. He's really passionate, you're going to see, he's passionate about reducing the societal impact of prevalent urinary symptoms, and this is precisely what he's going to talk about today. So, John, without further ado, thank you so much, and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much for your kind introduction, Leila, and for the opportunity to speak, and Thanks very much to the audience for your time. I hope to do a number of things today. I hope to really try to explain a little bit of the background about urinary symptoms and about how a number of individuals, including myself and, and our group, are trying to tackle really a quite significant societal problem. Um, so forgive the rather glib title about desperate times call for desperate measures. That is entirely true, but uh, it's a, a bit of a silly way to put it. Uh, really, the focus is the innovation in the management of urinary symptoms. I have on this first slide my contact details. So, of course, you're very welcome to ask a question um, and I'll look forward to answering that. But if you don't want to do that in a public forum and would rather contact me by email or via Twitter, then my contact details are given on that first slide. And I. Uh, you know, very much welcome that contact. So um, I'd like to just start by giving you an overview of what I'll talk about over the next 40 minutes. First, I'd like to set the scene to tell you about the challenge that healthcare professionals and researchers like myself um, are faced with, which is that there are urinary symptoms which are highly prevalent and that are very impactful on the individual, on carers and on society. And how related to this, a lack of knowledge adds to the problem. I'm quite a fan of little graphics and so uh, the graphics there are to illustrate um, you know some of the symptoms that people suffer with. So that can be discomfort because they feel that they need to use the bathroom. It can be waking during the night to avoid uh, the contents of the bladder. That's not Santa Claus, that's somebody waking during the night. And then on the right hand side, uh, rushing to the bathroom. Okay, so that's the challenge. What about the solution? Well, I would advocate that the solution comes in the form of information, uh, in signposting individuals to available services and encouraging conversations to remove some of the stigma that's associated with urinary symptoms and to try to get individuals to seek help at an earlier stage. Um, but in parallel to activities around education, our research group is also developing the means to develop new tools for the earlier diagnosis of the basis of urinary symptoms of underlying conditions. And I look forward in the latter half of the presentation to tell you about that really exciting work. So this is an overview and I'll start by setting the scene, telling you about some of the background, okay? So firstly, just a tiny bit of biology. This image on the uh, left-hand side is a graphical representation of the urinary tract and everything below the kidneys is described as the lower urinary tract. That's important because I'll talk about lower urinary tract symptoms. So there's the symptoms uh, associated with the function of those organs. So that's the ureters that come down from the kidneys, the bladder, and then the outlet of the bladder, which is called the urethra. And that's indicated on the right-hand side. So we have a 
a, a diagram that I've made on the right hand side there. Um, and that is illustrating the different um, anatomical components of the lower urinary tract. The phrases I've just used, the ureters coming down from the kidneys, the bladder. Um, my pointer doesn't work on the screen, so forgive me, but I can't indicate that with a pointer. Um, and then at the outlet of the bladder, we have a number of different anatomical mechanisms that ensure in health that the contents of the bladder don't spontaneously leak. So there is a neck to the bladder, which would stay contracted. And then there is a, a sphincter that goes around the urethra. And then finally, there is the pelvic floor muscles, a network of muscles which together um, provide continence. All of this is innovated, so nerves are provided and they provide signals um, and, um, and, and they're indicated in yellow. So on the diagram on the bottom right hand corner, they're, they're in yellow. Okay, now I want to just spend a moment to differentiate between two different stages that the bladder will be in at any time. So the bladder is either in the storage state or in the voiding state. Storage is what I think we're all doing at the moment. Our bladder is slowly filling with urine, trickling down from the ureters and expanding to accommodate that urine. So the bladder muscle is relaxed and the mechanisms that I described that are responsible for maintaining continence, they're contracted. So the various different structures at the bottom of the bladder are contracted. So it's a little bit like holding a balloon closed with a finger and a thumb. This stops the contents of the bladder from escaping, and that's storage. By contrast, the opposite state is voiding. So in voiding, rather than being relaxed, the bladder muscle contracts. So it's like squeezing a balloon. And at the same time, the mechanisms that ensure continence, ordinarily, they relax. So we remove the inhibition, um, we essentially let our fingers off the bottom of the uh, balloon and therefore we allow the content of this hypothetical balloon to, to empty. And that's illustrated in the diagram in the bottom right hand corner that we contract the bladder, so we're squeezing out the contents of the bladder and at the same time relaxing the neck of the bladder to allow the contents to escape and that's voiding. Okay, so we have storage and voiding. Now, Quite a shock to many people, uh, Layla, uh, as an example of that, would be that 70% of adults experience urinary symptoms. There are lots of different studies that have been carried out, usually very large studies. This is the most recent, and it was a very high quality study with 6,000 participants. And it was found of 6,000 adults, uh, in this case in Poland, 70% of those adults experienced urinary symptoms. Okay, so they're not old adults necessarily, they have a range of 40 to 90 years old, and of those adults, 70% experienced urinary symptoms. Um, so what do we mean by urinary symptoms? Well, they include symptoms that we can define as storage symptoms. So symptoms that we would experience when we're in the storage phase. So that could be the need to void the contents of the bladder more frequently, waking during the night to void the contents of the bladder, a sensation of urgency, that's a desire to avoid that you can't put off. You, you have to go and you have to go now. And incontinence. There could be symptoms of voiding. And there's quite a long list there, but um, that could be painful urination, some head hesitancy, poor or intermittent stream, straining, prolonged voiding, a uh, feeling of incomplete bladder emptying and dribbling. And then there are associated symptoms such as blood in the urine, some abdominal pain, such as below the navel, or loin pain at the one, of, one or both of the, the sides and the lower back. So there's a host of different symptoms that we call urinary symptoms, and these are experienced by 70% of individuals, of adults. Um, now, I think it's worth just being really clear that these symptoms can arise through mechanisms that are nothing to do with disease or pathology. So in the top right hand corner I've indicated that they could be due to lifestyle, of course they could be due to pathology, they could be psychological and they could be induced by medications. And let me explain that by giving a, an example. So a single symptom, that of urinary urgency, where somebody has to dash to the bathroom, 
they could be caused, urinary urgency could be caused by any one of four different categories of uh, underlying causes. So, for example, fluid intake, you know, if you're taking certain substances like caffeine or alcohol, they can make you void the contents of your bladder more frequently and they can induce urinary urgency. Likewise, if you drink a lot of fluid or drink fluid late at night, it can influence the, the timing and the, the nature of voiding. There are a host of uh, different diseases and symptom complexes that cause urinary urgency. Some of these you'll be aware of, so I'm sure many of you will have heard of urinary tract infection, um, but others you'll be less familiar with. So, for example, something like interstitial cystitis is quite prevalent, but really underreported. So a host of different pathological bases for urinary urgency. Then there is psychological aspects such as situation. So when you walk through the front door or if you're on a train and you know the toilets are broken, this can produce urinary urgency. The fact that you can go or the fact that you can't go can very much influence your perception of the bladder's fullness. And then finally, medications can have either direct effects that can produce the sensation of urinary urgency and there could be side effects to medications as well as the interaction of medications. So what I hope to do with this um, slide and this diagram that I've made is to illustrate to you that there can be a number of different bases for a given urinary symptom. So to say that urinary symptoms are experienced by 70% of individuals seems like a very high number and many people would assume that actually the causes are unlikely to be pathological. But I'm going to go on to explain that in almost all cases they are, unfortunately. So how, how can clinicians, how can healthcare practitioners separate potential causes? Well, with a very brief GP appointment, sometimes with a follow-up, it's quite straightforward for a practitioner to distinguish between lifestyle causes, the effects of medications, and psychological factors. So there's a number of different tools that a practitioner can use and these factors can easily be assessed. Now, to determine pathological causes is significantly more burdensome and more challenging and that often requires subsequent assessments. However, based on a large number of different studies, uh, I and others would conclude that the uh, basis of lower urinary tract symptoms is more often than not, significantly more often than not, pathology, with just one, two, maybe five percent of cases being associated with non-pathological causes. So we really are talking about the pathological basis of lower urinary tract symptoms. So I'd like to spend just a few minutes now to talk about some of the quite unpleasant and uh, eye-opening statistics that are associated with the prevalence and impact of urinary symptoms. So I talked about 70% of adults in a Polish population suffering with lower urinary tract symptoms. Another study performed in the UK said that 14 million people are suffering with bladder problems. Now this included children as well as, well as adults, but that is a very high number, about one in five. Uh, in 2010 alone, which I appreciate is a while ago, 27,000 men were hospitalised in the UK for untreated symptoms. Um, so that's urinary symptoms as a whole. And if we just now narrow it down to specific symptoms, in terms of incontinence of women that are suffering with either moderate or severe incontinence, fewer than a third were found to be receiving health or social services for their condition. So women with symptoms were not getting the help that they needed. And incontinence is a significant reason for care home admissions. Now, in terms of urinary tract infections, a condition that many people unfortunately experience or are all too familiar with, um, the, the first statistic is that the rate of admissions has almost doubled in the last five years. So that's hospital admission, sorry. And that could be avoided through early intervention. And then a second statistic is that urinary tract infections are the most common healthcare acquired infection. So what we mean there is that somebody goes to a, um, a healthcare establishment like a hospital and unfortunately picks up an infection while they're there. And 
when that happens of those infections, uh, a urinary tract infection is the most common acquired infection, unfortunately. So some harrowing statistics. Now, if we think about the impact of urinary tract symptoms, and we, we think specifically about just one example, that of incontinence, where there's a lot of data, well, women with incontinence are two to three times more likely to suffer from mental illness, unfortunately. And the impact of incontinence is very broad ranging. And there's a really good study that I cite at the bottom that uh, looks to expand, uh, to try to describe this in detail. So the first impact is emotional, the fear of incontinence in public and the feeling of becoming socially withdrawn. The next is relationships, particularly fear of intimacy if uh, their female is involved in a relationship. Females with incontinence are much more likely to stop exercise for fear of an incontinence episode. In terms of employment, there's a feeling that somebody who's incontinent is stigmatized. They have a feeling of reduced self-confidence and self-worth, and it leads to periods of absence, that is calling in sick. And finally, the quality and length of sleep is severely impacted in individuals, particularly women, that suffer with incontinence. And many such studies have been performed and they show the same. They show very similar um, indices in, in men as well as in women, unfortunately. So as well as these impacts on mental health and associated societal impacts, such as in terms of employment, there are impacts that relate to incontinence as well. So um, incontinence is a leading cause of falls and fractures. As people rush to the bathroom or they respond to having had an incontinence episode, they're more likely to, to fall. And as they fall, they're more likely to break a bone. And then this can have quite serious consequences such as infection or um, other illnesses, other conditions. Individuals with incontinence are more likely to have urinary tract infections, more likely to have lesions, etc. So as well as incontinence having a direct effect on somebody's mental health and it, incontinence as a symptom having a significant effect on the individual, um, there are ripples in the pond, there are other associated effects and falls and fractures are a, a significant one. Um, so there is morbidity and mortality that are associated with something that seems benign in incontinence. Clearly it's not benign but that might be our first impression if we know no other. And as I explained in the previous slide, incontinence is associated with premature, premature institutionalization into a care or nursing home. Uh, this is something that's really important to address. And there are huge direct and indirect costs. Now, unfortunately, the very few studies that um, do, I think, a, a thorough job of assessing this, um, when there are these studies, the numbers almost seem laughable because they're particularly large. So there's a study from about five years ago that looked at the worldwide burden and estimated it in the trillions of dollars. That's right, trillions. And a very good study from 10 years ago, from 2010, estimating that the burden in the US uh, for direct costs alone is about $60 billion. So huge direct costs associated with providing healthcare to individuals, but also the additional indirect costs of um, days lost from employment, etc. So significant costs associated with something that might otherwise seem fairly benign and, and harmless, which of course it isn't. Um, now, unfortunately, patients delay seeking help. So as few as 20% of patients seek help when they suffer with urinary symptoms. And many people have tried to understand what barriers there are to patients seeking help. And those barriers include a lack of knowledge, both of the condition and of available treatments. Misconception of what symptoms are normal. You know, what is healthy aging? Unfortunately, many people believe that being incontinent or suffering from any of the urinary tract symptoms that I've described is part of healthy aging, like one's hair turning grey. Um, and so that is a second barrier, a misconception that actually this is just part of ageing. A third misconception is not wanting to bother healthcare practitioners. People feel that urinary symptoms are relatively benign, that actually it's not worth bothering somebody about. Of course, there is significant embarrassment to suffering with urinary symptoms. Now, the work of 
myself, our group and others has shown that as symptoms become more severe, the bladder itself becomes altered. So the best way to illustrate that is to use an example from a different field. Um, if we think about Alzheimer's and the changes that occur with Alzheimer's, many people will um, be aware of behavioural changes that are associated with Alzheimer's. But I know many people have seen what happens to the brain in Alzheimer's. The brain shrinks and we get these, oh, sorry, I, I can't use my pointer, it's not working. But we, we see these um, cavities, these gaps in the brain uh, in severe Alzheimer's. And if we take a very thin slice of tissue and then we use some dyes to have a look at um, how the brain may have changed on a, on a very sort of fine basis, we see the infiltration of certain proteins that we uh, now know to be important as the condition worsens. So we can see in the very final panel, uh, panel C and panel F, we can see changes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease that we don't see in a healthy brain. So we understand that changes occur to the brain both on a very kind of fine scale and also on the, the wider scale. The image on the right shows the fine scale and the image on the left, uh, the broader scale. Now we see exactly the same in the bladder and I haven't got so many images, I don't really want to focus on too many technical details, but we see something very similar in the bladder as, condition, as the conditions develop. So as symptom severity increases, as time goes by, as somebody's suffering for uh, 10 years, 15 years with urinary symptoms, we see changes to the properties of their bladder. We see changes in function, we see changes in what makes up the bladder. Um, and so we think that actually this is something that's key to address at an earlier stage. Now, so the hypothesis is that late, later diagnosis resulting uh, in a remodeled bladder, in an altered bladder, may be why medication received by patients with symptoms is only partially effective. Now, I don't want to make this too sciencey. Um, but here are some data from a clinical trial from 2008. It seems like a long time ago now. Um, now, the data are showing uh, the findings from a clinical trial that lasted for, and I forget whether it's 12 weeks or 16 weeks, so END represents either 12 weeks or 16 weeks. And in this clinical trial, the scientists are comparing two new drugs. They're called torteridine and fesoteridine, but their names are not important. So two new drugs compared to a placebo. And there are two measures that are being assessed. The top graph shows a measure of urinary frequency. So how many times are the patients that were recruited to the clinical trial, how often are they going to the bathroom to avoid the contents of their bladder? And we see at the start of the trial, it's between 11 and a half and 12 times in every 24 hour period, so relatively frequently. And the bottom graph is showing those occasions where somebody feels a sense of urgency, I must void my bladder right now, and then unfortunately they have a period of incontinence, an episode of incontinence. So over the duration of the trial, we can see from both the top graph and the bottom graph that there is some improvement, that there is a reduction in the number of episodes that somebody's either going to the toilet, the top graph, or having incontinence, the bottom graph. And what we can see if we compare the two new drugs in blue and green with a placebo, so just a, uh, you know, a pretend medicine shown in red, in pinky red, we can see that there is a, a benefit to these new drugs. And so, you know, everybody should be happy with these data. It looks as though the drugs are effective. But I want you to look a little bit closer. So we see in the top graph that actually we have a reduction in the number of times somebody's voiding the contents of their bladder by just about one time in every 24 hours. So from an average of about 11 times to an average of just under 10 times in every 24 hours. So just a reduction of one trip to the toilet in any 24 hour period. Likewise for the bottom graph, we can see the number of times that somebody will be incontinent is reduced from about three times in any 24 hour period to about one and a half times, something like that. So what I'm trying to demonstrate with this graph, with these graphs and this slide, is that there are benefits to these medications, but the benefits are relatively small. And 
I hypothesize, many other people hypothesize that these partial benefits occur because people seek help at a late stage when their bladder has become modified. And so something that's important to the strategy of our research group is to provide early diagnosis, therefore directing early treatment and hopefully more effective treatment. So having hopefully provided a foundation for the challenge that myself and others face, I'd like to spend the next uh, no more than 20 minutes talking about the solutions that we and others are trying to develop. And the first is around education. So in 2019, I began a project uh, with Tenor to provide information to patients and carers about their conditions, about available treatments, to explain that urinary symptoms are not normal and are not part of healthy aging, and that urinary symptoms can be improved through treatment. And this was, um, you know, one of the first times that a large organisation such as Tenor uh, had, you know, very clearly stated information like that. Uh, so I think it's a really important step to try to address this need to educate educate patients and their carers. And um, likewise, we provided quite significant signposting to available services. That is, of course, GPs, but it's also pharmacists. It's um, many different types of healthcare practitioners, depending on the type of uh, condition that somebody's suffering with. So it could be a physiotherapist, for example. Um, but it's it's also support groups and patient fora and other organisations. I've got some information at the end about that. And also what we have been trying to work on is to encourage people to have conversations about their symptoms um, so that we can support loved ones who are uh, unfortunately experiencing symptoms to try to support them through their journey to, to get help um, and, um, and to keep persevering to seek help which is effective for them because there's not a single cure or a single treatment that is universal. Okay, so that was the first piece of work, the first piece of work to provide education to patients and their carers. And here is an example. So there are a number of pages on Tenor's website, um, around 30 in total, a few more than that. And they're written in clear English and non-technical language, lots of links to sites that provide more information with signposting to relevant support services. Um, so please do have a look at that. I think it's really important. The second approach that we uh, are embarking on is to upskill the NHS England workforce with regards to the management of continents. So I've been working with King's College and um, sponsored by Health Education England to put together a e-learning package um, for all employees of NHS England to undergo as part of their continuous professional development. So the aims here are to try to make practitioners understand what effective management is from the perspective of the patient. And there are some surprising things here. So quality of life is more important to individuals than continence. That is, you can have somebody who is incontinent and you can improve their symptoms to such a degree that it really makes a significant difference to their quality of life. And you don't need to necessarily keep going to try to stop all of their symptoms. All, all that is really required is to improve the quality of life of that individual to a level that allows them to do the things that they want to do. So key to that is identifying treatable, potentially reversible conditions and identify other factors that can contribute to urinary incontinence or urinary symptoms. Also to understand negative consequences of interventions. So for example, if somebody is suffering with incontinence, uh, one might be tempted to catheterize that individual. Catheters are great and they're great for many people, but they have side effects. So for example, somebody who is catheterized is more likely to suffer from urinary tract infections. And this might be actually significantly worse for the individual in the you know, whole picture. So it's important that the caregiver understands some of the negative consequences of some of the treatment choices. And finally, to provide a holistic approach with a multidisciplinary team. Now, we're doing something really similar with this, or the plan is to do something really similar for care homes. 
Um, so in collaboration with Wessex uh, AHSN, so the Academic Health Science Network, and a few other partners in this area, we're putting together a program of work to provide the upskilling of care home workers for the better management of continent symptoms. And again, we're going to use the e-learning approach to provide the means for individuals working in care homes to upskill and to better um, understand continent management uh, in a way that's accessible and easy for them to, to learn. So this is around the diagnosis and management of continence and incontinence in the older adult. And again, to focus really on understanding how symptoms can present differently in the older adult. So for example, a urinary tract infection, which in a younger adult may be associated with painful urination, blood in the urine, frequent urination, in the older adult presents often quite differently. Um, sometimes with confusion or a change in behaviour. And many care home um, staff may not, unfortunately, have received the training to recognise this different presentation in the older adult. Uh, they also need to understand the influence of other diseases, comorbidities, and the influence that medicine side effects can have on urinary symptoms. So it's a programme that we hope to roll out from May of 2021 within the Wessex region. And I've, I have a map there of the Wessex region. So it's a, it's a you know, very exciting project to be, um, to be leading. I'm really delighted to have the chance to do that. So that was a, a kind of a whistle-stop tour of some of the work that uh, I'm leading or involved with regarding education, signposting and uh, kind of improving conversations around continents and around urinary symptoms to try to better address it at the start uh, and, and at an earlier stage. Um, in my final 10 minutes, what I'd like to do is to talk about some of the exciting work we've been doing around the diagnosis of underlying conditions. So the premise here is one that we see in lots of other diseases and conditions, the early intervention, early treatment is much more likely to be effective. So this is a slide or a, a figure that I've taken from Cancer Research UK describing how early intervention of cancer is much more likely to be effective. But this is true for many different diseases or symptom, symptom complexes that early intervention is effective. That's the basis of our strategy towards trying to address some of the significant societal and individual burden that urinary symptoms have, early intervention. Okay, now I previously explained that it's quite challenging to diagnose the basis of somebody's urinary symptoms, that there are uh, often the cause is pathological um, and that it takes time and a number of appointments to be able to understand the basis of symptoms. So having explained that previously, I'd like to build on that and show you something that I put together. And I hope that this is accessible and interesting and builds on that point. So there are lots of different diseases or symptom complexes, which unfortunately um, present to a healthcare practitioner in a similar way. To illustrate that, what I've done is to list along the top the different symptoms that I previously described. So we have storage symptoms, and I've defined each of these. We have voiding symptoms, and again, I've defined these, and then we have other related symptoms associated with lower urinary tract uh, diseases and, um, and, and symptoms, okay? So across the top, we've got symptoms. Now, along the left-hand side, um, I'm going to list a number of different diseases or symptom complexes, and I want to show you that there's significant overlap in how these different conditions present. So a urinary tract infection in a younger adult would be urgency, frequency, pain when voiding. Um, and in the older adult would present actually quite differently. So the, the circles which are open represent symptoms which can occur, but don't occur in the sort of textbook definition of a urinary tract infection. So the presentation, the symptom profile in urinary tract infection can differ quite, quite substantially, um, particularly with a difference between younger and older adults. 
overactive bladder, which is, I guess you would say my specialty, um, overlaps. So it's defined by urgency, waking during the night to void, increased frequency of voiding and incontinence. Something called stress urinary incontinence is when there can be damage to the pelvic floor muscles because of childbirth, and this manifests as increased frequency and incontinence. Interstitial cystitis overlaps quite significantly with the aforementioned conditions, but is also associated with some abdominal pain. An enlarged prostate, which will happen in about one in two males, um, often presents initially with a weak stream or incomplete voiding, but um, if untreated or um, if treatment is not particularly effective, will then manifest with the uh, storage symptoms that define overactive bladder, so urgency, waking to void, frequency and incontinence. And then finally, cancers of the lower urinary tract will present with a number of different urinary symptoms. So in what seems in hindsight like a fairly complex slide, all I'm hoping to get across is that there's overlapping symptoms associated with a number of underlying causes. And this creates a significant challenge for the healthcare practitioner when they are trying to make an assessment towards the appropriate diagnosis and treatment. And I expressed that overactive bladder is my specialty and it's this condition that we have spent uh, a number of years now trying to improve the diagnosis of. So I'm going to tell you about briefly about a study that we have been doing that is continuing and is really, in my opinion, really exciting. So first and foremost, I really need to be honest and say that this work was led by a former PhD and former postdoc, postdoc um, Dr. Sepinud Fruzman, uh, absolutely fantastic scientist, pleasure to work with. Um, and this was the subject of her PhD. We wanted to see whether urine in, um, whether chemicals within urine could be used to diagnose early overactive bladder. And remember, overactive bladder is one of the causes of urinary symptoms, and it's defined by symptoms of storage. So it's urgency, waking during the night to void, frequently voiding during the day, and in many incontinence. Okay, so we want to try to diagnose this at an earlier stage so we can treat at an earlier stage because we know that if we let the symptoms develop that actually the drugs don't work particularly well um, because the bladder perhaps has been remodeled. Okay, so she analyzed chemicals within urine in participants who either had no urinary symptoms or who had early stage overactive bladder. Okay, so mild to moderate symptoms. And she was able to identify specific chemicals, chemicals which are specific to early stage overactive bladder. So we published that work earlier this year. We patented the chemicals because we want to develop a test to be used by healthcare practitioners. And the details are at the bottom of the slide there. Now there was huge media interest. Um, I'm delighted and a little bit surprised to say. So it made the online and print media of a number of different countries. We have um, some, some French media there <laughs> um, for, for Leila. Um, uh, but it was, we, we made the Florida Post, uh, I'm proud to say, and uh, we, made, uh, we made newspapers all around the world with, uh, with this discovery. Um, I think many people suffering from urinary symptoms, clearly newspaper editors recognize this and uh, you know, wanted, some good, wanted some good news. So uh, it, did, it did make the news and uh, that was a, you know, a proud and humbling moment for myself and, and Seppi. Um, but we want to take that discovery forwards. It's not just a discovery, we want to use this as a, develop this into a tool that can be used by a healthcare practitioner. So we, together, Seppi and I worked to develop that vision. You know, how, how could we make this into a tool that could be used for diagnosis? So the first uh, aim is to create a test for the point of care setting. So we don't want people who are suffering with symptoms to have to go to hospitals for diagnosis, which is often invasive. We want to be able to diagnose where patients present with their symptoms. So when somebody goes to the GP surgery and they have symptoms, it'd be really good if the GP can make an assessment and a diagnosis there and then. The second premise is that we want the test to be accurate. We need to be able to distinguish the different causes 
of symptoms. So we need to be able to say that somebody definitely has overactive bladder and it's not that they have a urinary tract infection or a type of cancer. So it needs to be really accurate, it needs to be uh, able to distinguish overactive bladder from other uh, conditions that cause similar symptoms. It needs to be non-invasive. So there's a test that I haven't included because it's fairly graphic, an invasive test that's used in patients suffering with symptoms. Um, and unfortunately, that is not something that you would want to do to a frail elderly patient. So we want to develop a test which can be used in the frail elderly in care homes um, and therefore is suitable for all patients suffering with symptoms. We want it to have a rapid outcome. We want a single appointment with a, uh, an answer straight away. No need to send the sample away where samples can get lost or contaminated or even at best where there's a delay in getting an assessment. And then finally, it's necessary that the outcome of the test will be simple to use and interpret. That requires no specialist training, no equipment required, um, no PhD, um, but that something can be done by anybody. So you'll see that together, something a little bit like a pregnancy test would be appropriate for the test that we're trying to develop. But what we did is we went out to the different stakeholders to say, well, what would you like? And I say we, but again, this is CEPI's work and it's wrong for me to um, claim anything otherwise. So uh, in a project funded by Innovate UK in 2017, CEPI went out to uh, have conversations with 123 different stakeholders. So they are patients, carers, healthcare practitioners, representatives of people that may sell a device, um, clinical commissioning groups, which, if you're not aware, make decisions about what's adopted in a particular region by the NHS, um, pharmaceutical companies, and then manufacturers of devices. And those conversations are really important because they shaped the next few years as to how we then aimed to develop this, um, this test. So how our test will work is that it will be cheap, easy to use, provide a rapid outcome and be non-invasive. Uh, we'll produce it in such a way that it can be used in the GP surgery, pharmacy, nursing care home. It can be used, of course, at a hospital, but ideally we want to provide clinicians and healthcare practitioners with a tool that can be used where patients present with urinary symptoms. So our vision is to create a device, and, oh, sorry, I'm still trying to use a pointer and failing, um, a device that can be dipped into urine and provide a, a rapid outcome. The best way to do that, to, to assess uh, a dipstick test, is to use something like a smartphone, because our test that we've developed and patented uses a patient's age and their gender as important factors in determining the probability of whether they have overactive bladder or not. And then we'd like to integrate telemedicine, um, because as soon as somebody has a diagnosis, we'd like there to be a healthcare practitioner available, whether it's on chat or whether it's um, like a video call so that we can make sure that the person who has symptoms gets the appropriate treatment straight away. We don't want there to be a diagnosis and then we're reliant on the patient going to their GP and, and seeking medication you know, with a separate appointment that, that wouldn't necessarily work. So um, we want to provide a system which you know, is a sort of one-stop shop for diagnosis and then the prescribing where, where necessary of the appropriate treatment. Um, so I'm delighted to say that we have funding for this work and I got confirmation of funding just several weeks ago and it's an incredibly uh, exciting and privileged position to be in. Um, so in March of next year, we'll begin work to develop a commercial prototype, which in September of the following year, 2022, we're going to evaluate in a multi-centre clinical trial. In parallel to this, we'll do a health economic analysis, which is a series of um, essentially financial calculations which provide the case that an innovation such as the one we're developing is going to have a significant economic impact. It's going to reduce significantly a lot of the costs associated with suffering with incontinence and um, and treating incontinence. And then late in 2023, so in, in three years' time, the idea is that the NHS and others will begin to adopt this technology, at least that's the plan. So that's the time frame for developing our discovery, which we've published and patented, now into a, a device that can be used where it's needed. 
So I'd like to just use the last couple of minutes to summarise what I've talked about. And forgive me for using graphics to do this, but I think you're all familiar with screens full of text and how boring they are. So in describing the challenge, I've talked about the fact that 70% uh, of adults um, are suffering with urinary symptoms. And that's not a single study. Of course, I quoted a single study, but there are many such studies that have shown similar levels of prevalence. Now, unfortunately, there are barriers to people seeking help. So all of that 70%. Unfortunately, um, the vast majority won't go on to seek help for their symptoms. And symptoms are associated with a significant impact on mental health. And they're also associated with um, other additional problems such as falls and fractures. So there is a significant challenge for healthcare practitioners in uh, addressing this. So the solutions that we have been working on uh, are around firstly education, about providing information, about signposting to available support and, um, and, and treatments, and about having conversation. And then the second arm of our work is regarding innovations, to, to produce innovations for diagnosis, something that uh, can be used in the healthcare setting. And the diagram in the bottom right-hand corner of the toolkit is a glib way of saying that what we want to do is to provide more tools for healthcare practitioners because they're desperate for tools which enable them to do their job. Um, they're as frustrated as anybody that some of the tools that they have access to really are not fit for purpose. So we hope to provide new tools that healthcare practitioners can use. And the test that we're developing is, is doing just that. So another way of summarizing is that um, over the lifespan from child to older adult, what we're doing is we're trying to address um, the issue from the younger adult all the way up to the older adult in terms of education programs. And um, I'd be very interested if anybody um, would like to work with us on this, I'd, I'd be um, delighted. Uh, I'm, I'm putting together a funding application at the moment to provide better education about um, urinary symptoms for secondary school children or secondary school individuals. Um, so if anybody would be interested in being involved in developing an education program with me, um, probably a pilot to be performed locally in the first instance, then please get in touch. My contact details are on the first slide. Okay, so um, we've been looking at education and I think there's a gap there for the adolescent. Uh, we, we don't do enough in schools to make people aware about how to better manage their urinary health. And we've also, in parallel to these education activities, been working at new diagnostics, which uh, span really the, trying to address diagnosis for the adult, because it's in the adult that the urinary symptoms that I've described occur. Um, so very finally, um, I just want to flag that there's lots of support available. So if you or a loved one is suffering from symptoms, then there's fantastic support available. And I work with a number of charities uh, your GP will be very happy to help. So please do seek help if you have urinary symptoms. That's so key. You know, if you take nothing away from the presentation other than this, it should be that you seek help if you're suffering with urinary symptoms. This recording is going to be made available. So forgive me if I now move on to my final slide, which is to thank a number of funders that have supported the work, and um, particularly to Dr. Sakanud for Rismond and uh, Jonathan Towes, uh, two people who uh, have worked in the, the lab for a number of years and um, have been a fantastic support in, in these projects. And there's a whole host of other students that have participated. And I believe that Nahid is uh, present in the audience and uh, Nahid is a pharmacist, uh, but she did a fantastic piece of work with me about diagnosing urinary tract infection, something that we're hoping to take forward. So thanks also to Nahid. Um, and, and the other students that have contributed. So with that, um, the talk comes to the end. Thanks very much for your attention and I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, John, for such an interesting presentation. There's a lot we're going to take away from your presentation. It was, it was so well prepared, so accessible, and I'm often telling that to our scientists colleagues. It's not easy to actually convey a complicated message in simple terms, so it requires a lot of work to prepare this type of presentation. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>
I have a question for, for, for you. I was particularly interested in the sort of interdisciplinarity of your presentation, you guess mm -hmm. for what reason, but I think you touch upon access to health as a human mm -hmm. access to education as well. As you said, a lot in your research has to do with education to health. Mm -hmm. And and my question has to do with uh, mental health. You touch upon the fact that this problem leads to mental health issues. What sort of mental health? I suppose that, of course, there's, there are issues of confidence and uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, let's say, uh, well, appearance and things like that. But what exactly mental health do you relates to? A really good question. Thank you. Um, so there are a number of different metrics which are used in large scale clinical studies when clinicians or scientists try to understand the impact of urinary symptoms. They'll ask um, validated questionnaires. Uh, there's a King's Questionnaire of Quality of Life, for example, which is often used. And the, the, the impacts are often, they relate to depression and anxiety. So, for example, some, somebody suffering with urinary symptoms will become socially withdrawn because they suffer with anxiety about becoming incontinent. Uh, or sorry, about having incontinence. If they, they go out and they go into a town centre, remember those days, Leila, um, they, they worry about having an incontinence episode in the middle of public. They worry about um, access to toilets. You know, they will use toilet mapping apps to try to understand where toilets are, but they would worry that those toilets will be closed or occupied. So anxiety, depression, um, but certainly low self-esteem. And there are a number of different um, impacts. What's really quite alarming, something I didn't mention, is that the quality of life impacts are as significant as neurodegenerative diseases and cancer. So on a par with conditions that we would otherwise think of being much more impactful, actually, the impact is the same. So I hope I've answered your question, but I had used it as a way to make the additional point that the impacts are really quite severe. You have very much an answered the question, and as you said, something which uh, seems quite benign is actually not. No. And that's certainly something really interesting in, in your presentation. Another question I have in relation to access to education somehow. We often hear that for girls and adolescents in particular in school, you know, um, it's difficult for them to go to the bathroom because sometimes mm -hmm. it's not safe or sometimes it's not clean or both. So I suppose that it might lead again to, to problems, health issues. So are you uh, tackling, addressing these questions uh, in your study? Um, I'm, not, I'm not addressing it at this stage, but that is exactly the plan with a piece of work that I'm putting together that I hope we can launch in about 12 months time. I'll be honest and say I need to get the funding for that work, to, that work first, but having been involved in now um, two, two projects with a third, uh, hopefully with funding confirmed very shortly. I hope that I have got enough track record to convince uh, a, a medical charity that this is work that needs to be done. When I've spoken with healthcare practitioners, particularly um, nurses who, you know, so aware of the, the challenges, um, they, healthcare practitioners will say that that's a huge gap, you know, to address education at secondary school level to address some of the points that you, you mentioned. Um, so urinary, so maintaining urine within your bladder for a long time makes it more likely that you'd have a urinary tract infection. Um, and it is, we know that it can lead to problems later in life. But we don't really know the association. Um, there have been studies that have looked back. Uh, so somebody who has urinary symptoms, trying to get that individual to describe aspects from their childhood, you know, did you suffer with urinary tract infections in your adolescent years, that sort of thing. And the links between adolescence and um, symptoms later in life are, are not particularly well established. So I think this would allow us to begin that. So um, to answer your question, finally, um, so uh, we are not doing that currently, but it's something that we need to do and therefore something that I very much hope to do. And if anybody listening would like to be involved in that, then they'd be more than welcome. Yeah, that, that's fascinating, I feel. And I suppose I'm not you know, a specialist at all, but I'm guessing that a lot has been done or a lot has to, to be done as well in the developing world where these problems are particularly uh, relevant and uh, mm -hmm. severe as well, access to, you know, sanitation, really. So that's right. That's right. 
I, I'm guessing, but tell me if I'm wrong, that a very comparative study could be also very interesting. I think so as well. Um, I, in my spare time, one of the ways in which um, I like to unwind is DIY. And I, I did a bathroom in the house myself, having never done plumbing and tiling and things before. And um, the culmination of this was to have a little thing that I stuck outside the finished bathroom, which is that the toilet is twinned. So there's an organisation called Toilet Twinning and uh, you pay £50 or something and it gives a funding for a toilet to be built in a rural community in a developing country because surprisingly about two to three billion people don't have access, okay. direct access to a toilet. Um, so they have to they have to go to a communal toilet, they have to improvise, etc. And it causes a lot of problems. So obviously some of the problems manifest in other diseases so sanitation related issues but for those individuals that have to wait to, to use a shared bathroom or something like this you know there, there are ramifications understanding that is really important so yeah i fully agree excellent thank you so much john we have a Pleasure. question from gloria the whole program and research sounds really exciting the presentation was very clear and thorough thank you very much thank you, thank you gloria I have one question about the diagnosis tool. What about those elderly who do not have a mobile phone to complete the diagnostic, the diagnostic process? Uh, is it something that someone else, like a carer, can complete on the behalf of the individual? Yes, that's that's very much the idea. That's that's an excellent question. And what we don't want to do is to exclude somebody that would benefit from this test. The whole idea of creating a test like this was to plug a huge gap because currently there are a bunch of clinical practitioners that would favour a, a highly invasive and expensive clinical test, which unfortunately is not suitable for the frail elderly. So very simply, yes, it can be performed by somebody else, um, but it is, it is really necessary to use a, uh, a smartphone to interpret the, the dipstick because the age and the gender of the person being tested are crucial components to the outcome. Um, so yeah, it could be done by somebody else. And, you know, I think in time, it could be that we can create a standalone device that includes um, the means for somebody to enter that sort of data manually. But again, that creates technical problems because, you know, if it's got fiddly little buttons and that would be a challenge, that sort of thing. So we want to make it as user friendly as possible. And as we develop it, we'll develop it with user groups to make sure that we don't leave any patients behind by creating something which, which isn't suitable for them. So it's a really good question from Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. It's excellent. It shows one more time that EOP is really at the forefront of medical research. We do some fantastic work and, um, you know, it's really great to be part of that. But, you know, I can't take any credit. This really was you know, the work of uh, quite a large research team and we're very lucky to have been the recipient of lots of funding over the years to do this. And without that funding or without that research team, we, we wouldn't be talking about it today. So, uh, yeah, we're very lucky. Very, very lucky and certainly very competent as well. Uh, another question from Roger, very interesting. Is there a connection with type 2 diabetes producing excess urine? Yeah, very good question, Roger. Thank you. Um, Type 2 diabetes does produce excess urine and longer term can lead to some damage to the bladder as well. Um, when diagnosis of urinary symptoms is made, uh, a clinician will often try to assess the presence of glucose within the urine um, to rule out metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes. Now, of all the tests that are available to a healthcare practitioner, fortunately, the assessment of glucose within urine is done pretty effectively with a dipstick. And so we can, a healthcare practitioner can rule out type 2 di diabetes or can, can, can determine whether somebody's urinary symptoms are because of metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes. Um, but if I can briefly go on to say that otherwise urine dipstick tests are really poor at diagnosing underlying causes. So we, while we use them to quite effectively diagnose um, the basis of someone's symptoms if that basis is type 2 diabetes. If the basis is a urinary tract infection, then dipstick tests are not fit for purpose, unfortunately. And that's why the work of Nahid, who, um, who, who was in the audience, um, is, is really important here. Mm -hmm. I hope I've answered your question, Roger. It seems so. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, John. I'm conscious of time. We will have to bring this to a close. But as you know, the meeting is recorded. It's going to be available on the website of our Research Futures webinar. I see that Gloria kindly just uh, put the a link uh, in the chat box to the Research Future website. So you will be able to listen again to John's webinar. John, thank you so much. That was really brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you to you, Leila, for the opportunity. Thank you, Gloria, for all your efforts to um, to host and to set this up. And thanks so much to the audience for giving me your time. Time is such a precious commodity and I, I hope it was uh, interesting uh, and, and potentially useful. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you so much again, John. I'd like to thank my team as well for the support. In particular, uh, Olga, Gloria, Re, Claudia today. And I'll see you next week for another really interesting discussion on something completely different, businesses and human rights, and in particular, online economy and human rights. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you. And I'll see you very soon. Thanks again, John. Thank you, Leila. Bye -bye. All the best, everybody. Take care. Thank exactly. you. Take care, everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.